beating. Does he go like a subway train? Faster. Ja, das sind alles, das sind, glaube ich, alles Fotos aus den äh, Anfang der 40er Jahren. Das ist ein Foto, das einlädt, ne? wo sie schaut in die Kamera und mit diesen schwulstigen Lippen und so, dass das, das dies, auch wieder diese Doppelmoral, ne? dass äh, hier in diesem Foto und auch die nackten Schultern, man weiß gar nicht, ob sie überhaupt angezogen ist, äh, dass da ein Versprechen auf Sexualität äh, geleistet wird, das keineswegs dann erfüllt wird. Und dann hier so ein Outfit, äh, wahrscheinlich vom Haute Couture. Und immer diese starken Diagonalen. Das scheint auch ein Stilmerkmal der, der Bilder bei Harry Lamar zu sein. Und hier mit einer Widmung an, an uh, Max Factor. Das hing früher im, im Max Factor Haus. Was ich immer ganz erstaunlich finde, ist, wie stark Augenbrauen und Lippen dieses Gesicht äh, bestimmen. Alles umrahmt von diesen dunklen Haaren. Wenn ich ein schwaches Herz hätte und einen schwachen Willen, wäre ich schon längst tot. Viele von meinen Freunden sind tot, weil das, sie konnten das nicht aushalten. Weil man, hat, man sagt immer, man muss was aufgeben, weil man berühmt. Man muss alles aufgeben. Naja, zuerst, als sie nach Los Angeles kam, unter Vertrag, hat man gleich ihren Namen geändert. Und zwar von Hedy Kiesler auf Hedy Lamar. Man fand dann auch nicht gleich Rollen für sie bei MGM. Und sie wurde dann äh, zunächst an, an, an Sam Goldwyn ausgeliehen, der dann ähm, Algiers gedreht hat. Das war ja ein Remake von Pepe Le Moco. Und dieser Film war so ein Riesenerfolg, dass sie sofort dann in, in großen Rollen äh, bei MGM äh, eingesetzt wurde. Mein Film von Max Stasi war ehrlich. Ich habe viel gekämpft, weil das für mich, für meine Familie nicht gepasst hat, aber sonst war es harmlos. I met her there in the set. She was, I think, 17 when she made Ecstasy. She was very shy. I thought she was very shy. You see, when I went to, to, to Berlin, I was supposed to play that part. Hedy Kisela was her name. And uh, um, my, he wasn't my husband then, you know, he had been my producer, Paul Corner. He saw Gustav Mahati, my pictures. And Mahati said, this is a wonderful picture. Where is she? He said, she's in Hollywood, but she can come. So he said, well, she'll be perfect for the part. So I went to Berlin thinking I am going to be in ecstasy. And when I got there, I asked for the script and uh, he said, I'm very sorry. I wouldn't like my wife to run nude in the woods. And I am offering you a better contract to be my wife. So I said, well, goodness. So months later we were married. And then after I was married, We were married, we went to Prague and visited the set. And I remember Hedy Kisseler playing in the seat, playing the piano. And Gustav looked at me and says, and now you come to see me after? And I said, I'm very sorry. I had a better contract. Ich habe dafür nie das gezahlt gekriegt. Wofür? Für den Film. Warum haben Sie den Film gemacht? Ich bin einfach hin, weil jemand hin war, dort war, in den ich verliebt war. 
Und alle haben mich gesucht und ich war weg. Von Wien bin ich dorthin. Und plötzlich geben die mir eine so eine Schiede. Das war eine nette Geschichte. Eine Frau war unglücklich verheiratet und sie läuft mit jemandem weg, der Straßen gebaut hat und Schloss. Und da habe ich gedacht, na, das ist alles. Und äh, dann plötzlich mitten in Prag sagen sie, ich soll mir alles ausziehen. Und sie sind weit weg und ich habe das alles geglaubt. Und äh, die waren auch weit weg. Ich habe nicht gewusst, dass es so etwas gibt wie eine Zoom-Linse oder sowas. Aber jetzt weiß ich besser. Allerdings ist es harmlos, ich bin einfach geschwommen. Das würde heute überhaupt rausgeschnitten werden von Filmen. Heute? Mein Gott im Himmel. Oder ja, der hat mich beinahe schlagen. Der Regisseur hat mich beinahe schlagen. Da. Wenn ich das nicht gemacht hätte. Also sich auszuziehen für den Film. Ja, ich habe mich gewehrt. Nur weil das nicht natürlich war damals in die Zeiten. Ich war, wurde sehr streng erzogen. Es war nicht in diesem Papier drin. Mayer war ja äh, sehr puritanisch und, und, und spießig und äh, es, es ging ihm darum, bei MGM nur saubere Filme zu machen und dass seine Schauspieler und Schauspielerinnen überhaupt nicht mit irgendwelchen Skandalen in Verbindung gebracht werden. Und MGM und die, die Publicity-Abteilung hat wirklich sehr versucht, auch den Skandal um Ekstase unter dem Tisch zu fegen. Und wenn man zum Beispiel die ganzen äh, Zeitungsartikel über Hedy Lamar in den 30er Jahren, als sie schon hier anfing zu schauspielern und Anfang der 40er Jahren, da wird Ekstase immer erwähnt und dass sie da nackt erschien, weil einfach, welche Schauspielerin hat das damals gemacht? This theater is proud to announce the coming of the Czechoslovakian English talking photoplay Ecstasy in its entirety. Judge for yourself whether federal authorities were justified in originally banning this film, which received the international award at Venice as one of the greatest pictures ever produced. Today, Ecstasy, notable for its beautiful music and English dialogue, is the most discussed motion picture in the entire world. Then I saw her in Prague at the, at the, when they were shooting the film. And then afterwards, when she came to, to MGM, then when she was in, in Acapulco, that she married uh, uh, the Swiss, uh, okay. which was a, a friend of my husband. And later on, I saw her only once. Mm -hmm. I cannot understand how a person that made so much money and so had to die in the poorhouse without any money, destitute, awful, awful. Ja, Herr Generaldirektor, ist eben angekommen. Ja, ja, ist alles in bester Ordnung. Ja. Herr Schmidt. Ja, bitte. Einen Augenblick bitte. Bitte, Fräulein Brandt. Sie haben mich eben geküsst. Nur aus geschäftlichem Interesse. Ein echtes österreichisches Kind. Nämlich ein echtes Kind der da des Österreich von damals. Jüdische Familie, katholische Erziehung, Theater, Liebesaffären, schon im jüngsten Alter. Draußen in Sievering, in Döbling oder Pötzleinsdorf, das hat sie mir alles erzählt. Also soweit ich weiß, war sie am Reinhardt-Seminar. Und jedenfalls hat sie in Wien der Akademie studiert. Und, die, und der erste große, also das erste Mal, wo sie wirklich in die, in die Öffentlichkeit kam, war dieser umstrittene Film Ekstase. Und äh, damit wurde sie also zumindest in bestimmten Kreisen äh, be bekannt. Ihr Körper wurde bekannt, obwohl ich finde, dass sie auch sehr gut gespielt hat in dem Film. Aber wie immer, und das war ihr Schicksal, hat ihr Körper ihre Seele über, überschattet. Und nachher habe ich die Königin Elisabeth gespielt. 
Wien, der an der Wien, Sissi hat das geheißen. Fritz Kreisler, Musik. Man hat sie mit einer Porzellanfigur verglichen. Das war der Bruder vom Kaiser Karl, der Erzähler Marx, der hat mich das so genannt. Aber die Idee ist, dass es wahr ist. Ich, bin, ich war sehr viel krank, schon bevor ich hergekommen bin. Äh, dann diese unheilvolle Beziehung zum Fritz Mandl, dem größten österreichischen Waffenfabrikanten der Zeit, der ein Faschist war, ich meine ein österreichischer Faschist war, also ein Austrofaschist, der nicht und deshalb sehr eng mit Mussolini verbunden war, aber dann den unverzeihlichen Fehler beging, auch mit Adolf Hitler Geschäfte zu machen und dann mit Mussolini entsprechende Probleme hatte. Und mit seiner Frau. Er hat ein großes Haus geführt, er war nicht nur ein, ein sehr reicher Waffenfabrikant, sondern auch ein sehr einflussreicher Politiker, er hat eine wichtige Rolle bei der Heimwehr, wie das damals geheißen hat, gespielt. Das sind die höchsten Offiziere, Minister, das hat sich immer im Detail erzählt, wer da alle im Haus ihres Mannes verkehrt ist. Er hat ihr sozusagen die große Welt geboten. Nicht? Er hat ihr eine gesicherte Zukunft, er wollte ihr auch in keiner Weise auf ihrer, bei ihrer künstlerischen Laufbahn im Weg stehen, obwohl er darauf bestanden hat, wie Sie wahrscheinlich wissen, dass der Film Ekstase nie wieder gezeigt werden darf. Er hat auch dann angeblich alle Kopien aufgekauft, noch vor der Heirat. Sie hat sicher den Steinberg erwähnt, weil sie, mir immer, weil sie mir oft erzählt hat, wen sie da alle getroffen hat. Nicht? Also zum Beispiel auch den Dollfuß, glaube ich, und, und den, den Schuschnick. Aber der Steinberg war sicher dabei. Der Fritz Mandl war einer seiner engsten Freunde. Der, der, denn die Heimwehr war eine bewaffnete Privatarmee. Der Mandl hat ihm die Waffen geliefert. Nicht? Sie war oft bei diesen Gesprächen dabei, nicht zuletzt, weil der Fritz Mandl sie zerherzeigen wollte nicht? und damit auch eine Atmosphäre geschaffen hat. Und schöne Frauen haben oft auch die Gabe, äh, Männern die Zunge zu lösen. Nicht? Ähm, er hat sie als ein kostbarstes Stück betrachtet, sozusagen, als eine Trophäe. Nicht? Sie war keine Sklavin, ich meine, aber er hat sie als sein Eigentum betrachtet. Und das hat sie zunehmend, wie sie älter geworden ist, auch mehr und mehr gestört und sie wollte ihre Freiheit und Unabhängigkeit haben. Ich schließe aber nicht aus, klug wie sie war, dass auch politische Gründe eine Rolle gespielt haben. Er hat dieser Faschismus und die, die ganze, der, 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 das Kriegsgeschäft ganz und gar nicht gefallen. Manche Leute die wollen das nicht wahrhaben, aber tatsächlich ist Österreich war das erste Opfer von Adolf Hitler. Nicht? Zuerst hat er den Bundeskanzler ermorden lassen. Und dann hat er das Land übernommen. Die Flucht ist nachgewiesenermaßen erfolgt im Winter. Und da war ein junger englischer Diplomat, der ihr dabei behilflich war. Und das war damals so, also so hat sie es mir geschildert. Das Haus war abgesperrt und sie hat auch keine Schlüssel gehabt. Das ist ja die einzige Möglichkeit, denn der Fritz war nicht da. Und die Hausangestellten, ich meine, die, die hätten sie erst recht nicht hinausgelassen. So war es, dass, dass sie durchs Fenster geflüchtet ist. Mit dem englischen Diplomaten, der, der, sie musste sie hinunterspringen in den Schnee, so hat sie das jedenfalls gesagt. Und der hat sie dann mit dem Schlafwagen oder wie immer, also per Bahn, nach London gebracht. Wo Zufall aller Zufälle einer der größten Hollywood-Produzenten zu dem Zeitpunkt war, dem sie vorgestellt wurde, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, der hat sich dann auf seinem Schiff in einer Luxuskabine nach Amerika, als Hedy Kiesler noch, nicht wie sie angekommen ist, hat sie bereits Hedy Lamar geheißen und den Vertrag bereits in der Tasche gehabt. Aber ich kann mir vorstellen, dass in ihrer Tasche oder unter den wenigen Dingen, die sie wahrscheinlich mit sich genommen hat, auch einige wichtige militärische Geheimnisse waren. I remember when all the refugees started coming. And in this room, and I have pictures from dinners, 
uh, we had all the, the great, great stars here. And uh, it was a very difficult situation for the German big stars to come here and begin a new life, a new, I mean, they were big stars and they were treated like, a, well, almost like extras, you know. Marlene? Marlene, Marlene, I went with my husband to the airport to pick her up when she came, yeah. And uh, she used to come later on and in my letter in the kitchen go and make a scramble eggs with Billy Wilder <laughs> till late at night. Here were all these people and was German spoken. This house was open house on Sunday. They made her a very big star. They changed uh, completely her appearance, became very glamorous and very beautiful. Um, she didn't talk much. She was very quiet, very quiet. So you didn't know. Uh, she never expressed herself, you know. So you didn't know what went in, in her mind. Würden Sie sagen, dass Sie Menschen scheu sind? Ich? Oh nein. Ich war nicht scheu zu Ihnen. Nein, das, das weiß ich. Ich meine, ob Sie hier in Amerika Menschen scheu sind. Nein, ich weiß nicht, ich verstehe mich überhaupt Amerika. nicht. Die Studios rule the life of, of their stars. They, they groomed them, they watched them, they made the publicity. They, they saw what they could wear and what not. And in a big uh, opening, with who they would go to the, to the opening, you know. Everybody's here, tall, bashful James Stewart and a lovely girl. Did you ask for glamour, Mr. and Mrs. Audience? Well, Hedy Lamar is here, but darn it, with her husband, Jean Markey. But who's going to win? Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier wonder with me. So do Mickey Rooney and MGM's E.J. Mannix. Gorgeous Hedy eyes that table crowded with my gleaming offspring. And with Judy Garland, Norma Shearer, and George Raft, anxiously awaits the Academy's momentous decision. Hedy, European Hedy, before Hollywood got to her, and that's what happened with Sidney Guterhoff and the proper makeup people like Bill Tuttle and so forth. That startling... Uh, dark-haired lady with the part in the center, which was created by Sidney Gileroff, who was the main hairstylist to the great stars at MGM. He created a style, and if you look at pictures of Hetty, even though the hair was in the center, parted down, almost every different time, it was a different version of that hairstyle. Sometimes the, uh, the part was higher, sometimes it was lower. But Sidney Gileroff was really magic at all that. Uh, really created that image. I mean, she's wonderful in films like H.M. Pullum Esquire, which is different. She wasn't just playing the glamour girl. Uh, she's most beautiful, I think, in a Ziegfeld Girl. When I met Le Miss Lamar uh, at the commissary, Les Peterson, who worked there, introduced me and said, uh, Miss Lamar, this is Mickey Rooney. And I said, how do you do? She says, how do you do? And I said, welcome to MGM, and may your stars shine bright. Everybody seemed to know everybody on the lot. It was a family of people who got together to make Metro-Golden-Mare the biggest Tiffany, the Tiffany of the motion picture business. We were good friends. Uh, you know, I was one of the biggest money makers uh, in the world in 1941. My pictures counted for 55% of the gross profits of Metro Golden Mare.
Yes, in white cargo. And And she had alabaster skin, so the makeup department had to make it a little bit dusty. She was just marvelous in this picture. I don't know much about the story, but I know that they always said, a lot of people said, I'm Tondalea. And uh, it became uh, a a name that people in Hollywood remembered uh, from White Cargo. Hollywood's most famous movie stars leave the film capital to help the government sell war bonds. Irene Dunn, Ronald Coleman, Hedy Lamarr, Greer Garson, all part of a contingent of some 50 screen celebrities giving their time and talents to aid the national war effort. No, you should need no request, for after all, you know that you're investing in the best. Till the lads come back again, back the old attack again. Bye, bye, bye. Oh, yes, I remember all about that. I was in the Army for four years, and uh, I was in France and Belgium and uh, uh, all over, but... Uh, you interrupted your career? No, uh, I, 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 they, they wanted uh, people, so I... I volunteered to go, you know, and of course, everybody, there are no winners in war. Uh, But the fact is, uh, we have to, for our country, we have to call when they want you, and we have to answer. And if uh, you're a good person, you do. Clark Gable was in the Air Force, and Jimmy Stewart became a two-star general in the Air Force. And then, of course, Bob Hope. He is responsible for the USO, uh, entertaining all around the world. Don't tell me you didn't get that. (laughs) That almost got me. You ready? I'd probably sing and tell a couple of jokes and uh, uh, would get some laughs to do their very best to make everybody feel right at home at the Hollywood Canteen. Okay. You're greeted at the door by Lana Turner, Deanna Durbin, and Marlena Dietrich. My baby. While Hedy Lamar hands out autographs. And Leonard, you have won here at the Hollywood Canteen a $25 bond, which is presented every night by a different studio. And with this $25 bond goes an additional 10-day pass. <laughs> Listen, uh, with, uh, you're going to take your bond now, but I, if you are the man I think you are from Brooklyn, you'll get Miss Hetty Lamar to seal it with a kiss. What about it, Hetty? Go ahead. Oh, hey, that ain't the Brooklyn I know, huh, gang? He was talking about his impersonations. He does the best Clark Gable, the best Humphrey Bogart, anyone in the whole world, because he was there in those days and he actually knew these wonderful people. Just give him a little Clark. Well, I say right now, it's a pleasure being here. (laughs) And it was a pleasure working with Hedy Labar. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it was. (laughs) What a beautiful lady she was. Yes. American I've ever met with a soul. It has a strange effect on me.
Es ging also um ein System, Funkverbindung in einer Art und Weise zu verschlüsseln, dass sie nicht abgehört werden können. Und das Ganze war also ursprünglich gedacht als Leitsystem für Torpedos, wurde allerdings im Zweiten Weltkrieg, zumindest offizielle Version, nicht von den Amerikanern angewendet. Sie hat dabei keinen Heller verdient, weil das Patent nicht mehr gültig war. Sie hat es patentieren lassen. Und ich sehe und höre alles viel mehr als andere an. Hören. Und wie wirkt sich das und aus? Und sehen. Es wirkt sich nicht aus, weil ich es ich nicht zeigen. Ich bin ganz einfach und trotzdem irgendwie kompliziert dadurch, dass ich sehr sensitiv bin. Ja, ich denke, Hedy Lamar war ja wirklich eine hochintelligente Frau. Und sie hat dann im Jahre 1942 zusammen mit dem ähm, Komponistin George Anteil äh, angeblich bei einer Cocktailparty saßen sie zusammen und haben dann ähm, überlegt, äh, was zu machen sei in der Situation, dass äh, zu diesem Zeitpunkt während des Krieges wurden ja die äh, amerikanischen äh, Schiffe, die nach Europa fuhren, immer wieder von den ähm, angegriffen von den, äh, von den Deutschen und umgekehrt und mit Torpedos. Ja, und diese Torpedos wurden ja mit äh, Funksignale gesteuert. Ja. Das Problem war, dass die Gegenseite immer diese Funksignale stören konnte. Und sie, einfach weil sie beide mathematisch und musikalisch gebildet waren, haben überlegt, dass wenn man diese Funksignale nicht durchgehend sendet, sondern dass also die Frequenz immer wieder verändert, dass dadurch es nicht mehr möglich sein würde, um diese äh, Frequenz, äh, diese Signale zu stören. Und sie haben dann ein Gerät entwickelt, der genau dieses macht. Und sie haben das dann patentiert und der amerikanischen Marine geschenkt. Der Clou bei der ganzen Geschichte ist, dass dieses, äh, also was Channel Harping nennt, also die, die Frequenz immer wieder zu verändern, äh, indem man ein Signal raussendet, äh, dass dieses äh, System heute alle, alle möglichen äh, Funksysteme unterlegt, also von Handys und etc., weil indem man immer wieder die Frequenz verändert, kann man viel mehr Signale ins Äther schießen. Und ergo war das eine unglaublich wichtige Erfindung für die heutige Zeit, nicht nur für, für damals für den Krieg. Ich meine, wir können so einen Menschen verstehen, die, der so viele Phasen hat wie ich. Ich habe viel mitgemacht, mein ganzes Leben. Und dadurch ist das schwer zu erklären. Die Menschen, die wenig Mitzug gemacht haben und nur Luxus gehabt haben und nichts Unangenehmes je erlebt haben. Äh, wie gesagt, ich verstehe die Details nicht, aber es war zweifellos eine sehr wichtige Erfindung, die zweifellos im militärischen Bereich. Und die haben öfter behaupt, von offizieller Seite behauptet wurde, wir haben es nicht verwendet im Zweiten Weltkrieg, umso skeptischer werde ich. Denn es war offenkundig, dass das eine große Sache war. Was will ich damit sagen, wie Sie annehmen? Nicht möglicherweise hatte sie darüber Details in, im Reisegepäck. Well, this, uh, I, this is Mr. Mayer, you know. I had one photo with my father and Mr. Mayer, and I showed it to somebody recently, and, and I don't know what happened to it. My father brought different projects to him, you know, like different writers, like Franz Werfer. 
helped. He arranged contracts for the stars like Louis A. Reiner and, and, and Hedy Lamar and many mm. others. Uh, he arranged contracts. The only thing, these two women were so so hysterical that uh, I think Mr. Mayer never forgave him that he got these two women to the, to the studio. But a lot of people uh, really disliked him and he, I think, ruined a lot of lives, you know. I mean, like Judy Garland. I mean, it's questionable, but but uh, at that time, you know, the, I mean, he was the king, you know, that that was it. And if they didn't perform the way he, he wanted, then it was very difficult. They, they broke, uh, you know, he, he had the power to do anything with them that he wanted. They had to go out with certain people, to be seen with certain people, and that made them, you know, very important. They just couldn't do what they really wanted to do, although, you know, they had big names and everything else. But, uh, I mean, uh, no illegitimate children or gay, God forbid, you know, that, that was taboo. Und da habe ich also so viele Rollen gespielt. Ich war Mutter und ich musste im Hintergrund stehen und dann war ich wieder im Vordergrund. Und ich wollte das nicht. Ich bin immer dasselbe Mensch. Ob ich das jetzt... Ich meine Kinder, wie sie schon gehen konnten, wurden, wussten sie überhaupt nicht, dass ich eine Schauspielerin war. Die haben gesagt, du, die sind aber gar nicht nett. Die Leute rufen dich über die Straße herüber. Beim Namen. Und da habe ich gelacht. Weil ich wollte nicht, dass sie mich nur, ich wollte, dass sie mich nur kennen als Person, als Mensch, nicht, dass sie wissen, wie ich das Geld verdiene. Das war natürlich der einzige Weg. And of course also with marriage or so forth, they, they couldn't just marry anybody. You know, it was very, uh, the studio was, I guess, very strict in their contracts, you know, that, that what they could do and not do. It sounds so glamorous, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's also a price to pay for all that glamour and money and everything else. It's, uh, I think, one, I guess, underestimated her intelligence, you know, because mm. she was so beautiful that nobody thought she could have any brains. <laughs> Wie hat zum Beispiel ein Studio da reagiert? Die haben meistens das so reagiert, die haben einen Arzt bestellt und es wurde abgetrieben. Ne? Und auch, äh, obwohl das illegal war natürlich, aber das wurde alles... Sie hatten unheimlich viel Macht damals und konnten solche Sachen regeln. Ne? Und wenn eine Mutter das Kind dann zum Beispiel jetzt in Mexiko oder woanders trotzdem auf die Welt gebracht hat, äh, wie wurde dann das geregelt? Ja, das, das Kind musste man äh, adoptiert werden. Here it is. To my true friends through the years who stood up for me in crisis and to the many kind people who wrote and telephoned, especially to my children, Mrs. Denise Hedwig Colton, Anthony John Loder, and my adopted son, James Lamar Loder. And what do you feel when you read this? You feel that she, she remembered me. <laughs> so uh, must have, she must have remembered me with fondness. To first Father Marky, you remember him as a person? No. <laughs> she was, how long she was married to him? That I really couldn't tell you. No, so I was very young, yeah. probably not very long. Your first name was was James Markey. Markey, mm -hmm. Ma Lamar Markey, or Markey right. Lamar. Yeah. And then you can you can just tell a little bit how it works with this adoption of what it was the the second name that you have. Well, all I all I remember is I had to go into a courtroom with a judge, and it was just the judge and me. And they asked me if I would like to be adopted by John Loder. And I knew my mother was married to John Loder, so of course I said yes, and he was always quite nice to me. I came here to ask you to marry me. Hmm. 
there was a nurse and uh, a housekeeper, and um, mostly the nurse took care of me. Her name was Frances. I don't know. She was from Canada. I don't know her last name. And then uh, we had a chauffeur from the uh, MGM, I believe it was. You know, with her schedule and things, uh, back then, a movie star got up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, went to the studio for makeup, and uh, they, like Louis B. Mary, they watched over them quite rigidly, and she might get home at 8 o'clock at night. So it, it was a tough life back then. It's not like it is today. You know, she was quite headstrong, and she knew what she wanted, and what role she didn't want to play and what role she did. And, and I guess she bumped heads with the big bosses. And that uh, was probably the beginning of her losing contracts and things like that. What happened was uh, when I was quite young, I think seven or eight years old, I went to Chadwick and I got in trouble in Chadwick and they told me I couldn't go there anymore. But there was a teacher by the name of Ingrid Gray. She was also German. Klepper was her maiden name. Uh, she said that I could live with her and her husband and go to the day uh, time and not stay there at nights. And since all my friends were there and everybody I knew, I, I agreed. And uh, <clears throat> my mother was disenchanted with that. And uh, she didn't... Uh, want anything more to do with me. She was angry. And when I uh, saw her again in Florida 41 years later, uh, she reminded me <laughs> of what I could have had. Mm -hmm. And I just feel that, you know, I, I made my own way. I'm not a rich man, but uh, I have enough. This whole time when man said that I was so ganz großes da, was immer. Ich habe das nicht äh, empfunden, weil meine Kinder waren mir viel wichtiger. Und ich fand, das alles ist nicht wahr und nicht wirklich. Es ist ja alles ein Beruf gewesen, wie jeder andere Beruf. Es war uh, in about 1962, ich bekam ein Zertifikat von meinem Birth Certificate. Uh, I had to have a top secret clearance from the Air Force, and the uh, people in the Air Force had to investigate in order for me to get this certificate. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever saw one, although I did try to get one. But, but this certificate is saying that John Loder is, is your father, and Hedy uh, Lamar, Lamar is my mother, is, and I was a natural born uh, yes. birth. The, the, the document is from 16 March, 1939, so. Well, I think they were, I don't know. Well, I was very young, so I really can't tell you what, what was going on. Yes. I believe that Louis B. Mayer had the power at the time to take care of these things. Was denken Sie über die Filme, die Sie gemacht haben? Ja, alle waren ein bisschen wichtig. Aber speziell wollte ich das Beste machen drin. Aber ich habe gearbeitet, wie ich ein Kind in mir gehabt habe. Da hat man einen Blumenstock da hingestellt, dass man es nicht sieht. Und so. This certificate does not appear to be an adoptive type certificate or one that has been amended over time due to some court action. As a matter of fact, it's even got a certificate of attending physician, which uh, gives all the details of when, where, and who he was born to. And uh, so I thought this was uh, practically a conclusive document really to the issue of, of whether or not Mr. Loder was indeed uh, Hedy Lamar's son. Mm -hmm. And that's Part of what I understand was the whole problem here. Uh, she was trying to escape any 
kind of uh, accusation that this child was born out of wedlock. But I don't think it was uncommon at all for those particular contracts to have what they called a morality clause. Uh, they want to make sure that their stars do not fall, uh, well, the public doesn't view them badly. In other words, their fame would, would fall. The idea is that they don't want to invest a lot of money in building up a star only to have them do something dumb or immoral and make the public angry at them, and then there goes their investment. My idea of hell is to be a woman alone in Hollywood. That's not easy. She was always beautiful, she was always crazy, and she was, uh, she was not a happy girl, you know. Die Menschen sind kalt hier und berechnen, und ich bin das nicht. Und jetzt sehe ich es eigentlich erst ein, wie ich es nicht war. Ich meine, ich, früher habe ich immer, alle haben mich sehr lieb, auch heute, aber ich bin nicht mehr so dumm. Ich meine, früher war ich immer nur Herz und alles, aber ich weiß, dass es auf das, das Land denkt nicht so wie ich. Ich denke, wie wir denken in Österreich. I met her when she was 16 going on 17. She was in Berlin in the house of Joe and Mia Mai, Kurs in Damm 70. I can see her in my mind's eye now. Never ever was there a more beautiful girl. It's a great joy of her friendship with, and, uh, with Elizabeth Taylor, who wasn't ugly. Hedy was more beautiful. Hedy was breathtaking. When we finally encountered each other again in, in Hollywood, and she could speak German, she could, uh, we could talk about the same uh, names that meant something to us and not to, to anybody else. I guess that made her comfortable and it certainly made me comfortable. And she was nice and she was warm and she was helpless and she was... I'm sorry that she... It's a peculiar thing to say I think I'm sorry that she lived so long and with such troubles at the end. There was an inquiry whether she would want to play Delilah, Samson Delilah. And I was going to Hollywood anyway on business. And I said, well, I will try and arrange it, I will, uh, telephone Cecil B. the Mill, who was going to direct it and produce it. And I arrived in Hollywood and I called from the hotel, Mr. the Mill's office. They had no idea who I was, of course, and, and uh, spelled my name. I said, I'm here for Miss Lamar. I was supposed to call, call Mr. the Mill. She said, the secretary said, I'll call back. Not a minute passed. He called. He was on the phone and he said, I will send the car for you. Come and see me. And I went and we made the deal. For he did. She got a lot of money. He was very anxious to have her. Samson and Delilah, the immortal story of the strongest man in all history. A masterpiece of big screen entertainment. But Samson was ensnared by the seductive beauty of Delilah. Daughter of hell. His lust became a trap that led to his downfall. She looked very beautiful, of course, in uh, Samson and Delilah. It was especially that particular scene I remember very distinctly when uh, Samson came to her little tent. She was wearing this black 
uh, outfit, black and the silk and black outfit. And then she, later on she came out and she looked so beautiful. It was unbelievable. And that time she was, I think, already 36 years old. The real reason that she somehow got out of the film business in a fairly early, you know, uh, age, uh, the real reason, what she told me, is not from me. She said she was lazy. She said, I'm lazy. I don't want to do any work. That's the real reason. And she was offered so many uh, film parts. Actually, she probably was the one who's responsible for Ingrid Bergman's success because all those, Casablanca was offered to her, she turned it down. And, and uh, Arch of Triumph was, you know, uh, and all those gaslight and all those, I think the parts were offered to her first, but she didn't want to do them. So they offered to Ingrid Bergman and made her a very, very big star. And uh, she basically, she just said that, oh, I don't want to work. I want to, you know, enjoy myself. Yeah, I don't want to work hard. She came very often. She liked coming to New York, stayed at the Sherry Netherlands or at the Plaza. Then she came to, to get married to Howard Lee. To Howard, uh, he's probably still alive, you know. Um, no, I think he. No, um, he's dead. We look on the, on the biography. He was so rich. Why did he die? <laughs> anyway, there you are. And my wife and I went with Howard and Heidi to Long Island City to be witnesses at their wedding, which was kept very quiet. So she was not very happy with her marriage? With her Marriages? Uh, no. She, well, there was so, so, how many were there? Five? Six. Six. Yeah. It would have been wonderful if she had ever found a man who would just uh, have accepted her the way she was. Ohne Liebe kann man nicht leben. Das hat ja schon wer mal gesungen. <laughs> leben ohne Liebe kann ich nicht. <laughs> Ist auch wahr. Das ist falsch. Und hier in diesem Land ist Geld vor Liebe. They were not being paid the fortunes that stars get now in many cases. And uh, the studio later decided they didn't want to have all that stuff on their, on their bookkeeping. So they started releasing some of the stars. Some of them formed their own production companies. Uh, they would star in films that they themselves produced. She formed a production company. Experiment Perilous and Dishonored Lady, I think, were two of the films that her company produced. She later played a couple of these classic ladies in, in a company of her own. I don't think the film did very well. Ladies and gentlemen, we present his satanic majesty, the devil, and a man. Together they introduce you to some of the most exciting people of all time. The big wheels of every age and the women who made them spin. The Story of Mankind. Hedy Lamar as Joan of Arc. Virginia Mayo as Cleopatra. Helmut Dantine as Mark Antony. Peter Lorre as the Emperor Nero. Groucho Marx as Peter Minuit. Möchten Sie wieder einen Film machen? Haben Sie sich yeah, immer überlegt? Was, was müsste das für ein Film sein? Eine gute Charakterrolle. Ich würde nicht mehr so was Dummes spielen wie vorher. Wenn schon, möchte ich etwas spielen, was Hand und Fuß hat. You know, MGM career was over. But there were other things that she did. She did guest shots on television shows. And uh, I was kind of working a little bit, trying to reactivate some things in the career. And she was still a beautiful lady. Well, this is when she was down in jail after the shoplifting situation. 
It was the uh, Sybil Brand Institute for Women. And uh, they were trying to accuse her of, of shoplifting. And I think she had a check in her, for several thousand dollars in her pocket at the time. It wasn't the case that she was broke. Yeah, well, I think that whole shoplifting thing was a scam. Uh, at the time, uh, a so-called manager that she had was trying to do a book called Ecstasy and Me. Uh, many of the pages she had not even really authorized. And he was trying to do a very sensational book. I have a feeling that this whole thing was set up, you know, by him. Did you have a shopping bag in your possession outside the store, as the security guard claims? What do you mean a shopping bag? A shopping bag containing eight items. Oh, I don't know. I, I had my shoes, yes, so they must have been in the shopping bag. She was supposed to appear in court on, on, it turned out to be the same day she was supposed to start the film for us. And uh, I had been at the house the night before. She knew her lines. She was all happy about doing the film. What, what went on the night before had to be uh, kind of a con job of saying to Hetty, you know, if you don't show up for, if you don't show up in court and don't show up at work and you're in a hospital sick, There'll be a lot of sympathy for you. The charges may be dropped. Well, that was not what was happening. And I saw her medicated. And uh, it was all part of a ploy that he was doing. I later had to replace her with Jaja Gabor in the film because we had to go on shooting. The, the charges were finally dropped, by the way. The whole thing was finally dropped. What, what is this? This was from the auction that Hetty had. Large cigarette box, silver on copper, monogram HL for Hedy Lamar. Uh, okay, here this was a dining table that she had, which she sold. Ahmed Dagliani, uh, oil painting that was from her collection. It's listed over here. I don't have the final realized prices on this, you know. Well, maybe it was before she moved to New York. They had an auction of a lot of, a lot of her things, and she wanted to boil, you know, cut down on on stuff. You're lovely. You're marvelous. Close your eyes. Listen. Can you hear it? That's my heart beating. Does it go like a subway train? Faster. I was a friend of uh, the most famous uh, masseur, uh, massage for celebrities in uh, New York, named Ken Galenti. And he, uh, he used to give her free, he felt sorry for her, so he would give her a free massage. And I would talk to her while she would be massaged. And she had no shame about being nude, you know. She was, at, she was in her well, late 60s, early 70s, and still quite presentable. Im Hotel zu leben heißt, ich wohne nicht hier. Das ist wie eine Brücke, nicht? In anderen Worten, ich bin also endlich einmal von Kalifornien weg, wo man schöne Filme gemacht hat. Eines Tages, das waren die schönen goldenen Jahre. Die sind weg, das ist, gibt's nicht mehr. Und jetzt bin ich auf einer Brücke. Und ich will mich nicht hier einsetzen. Ich bin seit drei Jahren hier, weil es so lange dauert. Aber ich möchte schon jetzt gern weg. Und bis ein paar Leute nach Europa, nach Wien. Weil dort ist mein Herz eben. Könnten wir irgendwie kurz Ihre jetzige Situation hier beschreiben, dass Sie diese Prozesse führen? Seit zehn Jahren, nicht nur wegen einem Buch, auch wegen anderen Sachen. Wegen einem Film, den man mir weggenommen hat, den ich selber geschnitten habe und andere Sachen. Aber was immer es ist, es muss fertig gemacht werden. Man kann nicht alles so halb machen. Man muss es fertig machen und dann gehe ich weg. Weil meine Heimat ist Wien. Und Österreich. Nie Amerika, nie. I, I asked her out to dinner a couple of times. And, and she took hours to get dressed and made up and all that. 
but mostly she, uh, she wasn't part of the party scene. Uh, she was like a recluse in New York. She was in this strange uh, private world of her apartment. She wouldn't go out much. And she lived in the Renoir Arms apartment on, in the East 70s, which was a respectable looking apartment house until you went into her apartment. And it looked like a slum because she was nearly blind at the time. Um, she had uh, trouble with her vision and she didn't see how dirty it was. And she wouldn't let any maid come in to clean it. And I remember distinctly that in her bathroom, she had what I call ring around the bathtub. There were rings of, of dirt around the bathtub that had never been cleaned. In those days, all the movie stars had f fabulous furs. And even though she'd hid on hard times, uh, she still had the furs, but she just treated them like well, literally like dirt. She was walking on them and, and, and treating. And the room, I wanted to clean it for her, <laughs> but I felt I would embarrass her. But she didn't see it. She was so out of focus, her eyes. She was too proud to wear glasses. And she was, uh, uh, that um, to her, she was just in a dreamland of her own. Once upon a time, not so many years ago, there lived a princess, and she was lovely and lonely. And far, far away across the sea, in a big hotel, there was a bellboy, and he was quite a boy. Say, you're a foreigner, aren't you? Yes. Well, now look, Toots, I'll explain it to you. Over here, we have two kinds of tomatoes. One is a vegetable, the other is you. Me? I I'm a tomato? She was far too intelligent to be a movie actress. And she told me when she did a scene to look sexy, she just said, all I had to do was look dumb, stupid. And that made me look sexy. Of course, she was joking a little bit. She was arrested for shoplifting, you know, uh, more than once. And once it was very pathetic because the product that she stole were laxatives. You know, like she had constipation, it was very pathetic, you know. Uh, the jury has very good ears. Why are you such a maniac, Eddie? I mean, uh... Well, I don't like Andy Warhol. And I never liked his technique. And I, um, I mean, didn't he have a drag queen play Hedy Lamar? Yes, it was. Yes, well, I, I disapprove of that very, very strongly. Look at all you guys are being alive. And here is the best part. You have a head start. If you are among the very class of maniacs. But when I was a kid, I just used to adore her. I would stay in a film, and her film was showing. I would sit there and watch her film 20 times, 20 times, 20, you know, every film we came out, I pretty, pretty much watched all her films, and not just once, but I would just sit there and look at her face. And then you never figured you would meet the real person, but then finally, you know, you became friends. It's on 3rd Avenue and, uh, you know, uh, Park Avenue area. It's just so convenient and there's so many restaurants. And we will walk down to, to uh, uh, Rockefeller Center. We would just walk. Yeah, she loved to walk, actually, those days. People will look at her, you know, because, you know, 
And the movie star looks different from ordinary people, no matter, you know, you may get older, but still, people will always think that, she, even those young people, they didn't know her maybe, and have never seen her movies, but they would know she is somebody, of some kind of celebrity of some kind. So this is why when we went to the bank or when we went somewhere, you know, sometimes we, we, we did a little bit, you know, work here and there, people would say, who is this lady, you know, she is different. I'm seeing so haben Sie irgendwelche von den sogenannten Sexfilmen gesehen, die es jetzt gibt? Ja, das ist aber Unsinn. Wie, wie ich finde, die alle sind Sexfilme, weil die Leute haben vergessen zu lieben. Jetzt tun sie auf Sex gehen, nur Sex. Und für mich, ohne Gehirn ist keine Liebe und dann ist auch kein Sex. When she had her plastic surgery done, of course, that was maybe in the 60s or 70s or whatever time that was. So those days, I think the uh, technical part of this plastic surgery is not as advanced as today. Today, I think people can do bigger miracles rather, you know, than, than those days. So if she were alive today, maybe she can, you know, even do some corrective things and it won't be so difficult because you have lasers, you have this kind of, all kinds of new technical uh, uh, procedures. So, but those days, I think it was just quite basic. You just pull your face up a little bit. Yes, and will this do in a sex film in New York, speziell. Ich habe ähm, ein paar gesehen und ich finde die lächerlich. Die Leute sitzen da wie Schachfiguren und haben das noch nie gesehen. So was. Ich habe das schon in Paris gesehen vor vielen Jahren und das ist alles <lacht> so wie Kinder sitzen sie da. Ich verstehe das nicht. She enjoyed being here very private with sitting on the lounge, jumping in the pool when she went and she would swim. And I remember it would be just her and I, and uh, she would be in the pool talking about the good old days in Hollywood when she was making a movie with Clark Abel or with John Garfield and uh, who she thought was a great lover and who wasn't and how would use and so on and so forth. She was being really dramatic and saying, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. Wenn man irgendwie ein bisschen älter wird, fühlt man sich, man braucht eine Kompanie, man braucht ein bisschen Gesellschaft, man braucht jemanden. Wenn man jung ist, ist man so voller Lebfreude, man will alles kennenlernen, alles sehen und das ist neugierig über das Leben. Und wenn man das einmal weiß, dann setzt man sich zurück und denkt, na jetzt habe ich also alles erlebt schon, jetzt will ich meine Ruhe. Hetty was a very quiet, um, um, shy person, actually. And um, she didn't like any of this excitement. She didn't, uh, she always had to sort of be, she felt, on stage. And I think that's the reason why she enjoyed coming here, because she didn't have to be on stage and she didn't have to have put on all her makeup, what she had told me. The reason why she left Hollywood and California was during the time that the Manson, uh, with that Sharon Tate, and she felt she was going to be a target, or she was a target, uh, so she had to leave. Mm, no, it's not that she had no money. I mean, she wasn't as wealthy as she was when she was in Hollywood or when she was in Austria, when she was married to Fritz Mandel, who was a multi-millionaire, uh, and she was married to this oil tycoon in um, Texas who had a lot of money. So uh, her money was a little bit more scarce, but it wasn't that she was destitute. She still could afford whatever she wanted to, living in the city and uh, in her later years. 
uh, she um, started to invest in a lot of stocks and made a lot of money in the stock market. That I'm talking about, say, the last five years of her life. Um, uh, she had, uh, she was awarded a five million dollar lawsuit with a um, a company in Canada, and that's where she had gotten a lot of money and she invested. So she was living fairly comfortable, you know. She was not destitute. Diese Brillanten und die Juwelen, die ihr da der Fritz Mandl in Paris gekauft hat, die hat sie in einem Plastiksack immer, wo sie war, bei sich gehabt, das sogenannte eiserne Reserve. Und dann, in, ich glaube, es war schon in Florida, also in späten Jahren, nicht, hat sie ja einen Besucher gehabt. Und am nächsten Morgen waren die Diamanten weg. Das war für sie ein schwerer Verlust. Es ist tragisch, wenn Sie sich zurückdenken, die strahlende junge Heldin aus Ekstase, Frau des großen Waffenfabrikanten in, vor Cartier in Paris, sagt die ganze Auslage, der kaufte die ganze Auslage. Und dann lebt sie in ihrem bescheidenen Haus ähm, in Orlando, Florida, vergessen von der Welt, eine alternde Frau. Und von einem Tag auf den anderen verliert sie diese... Offenbar hat sie die nie getragen. Das war, das war offenbar nicht die Idee. Und, das, und, hat, und hat, es, hat es verloren. Ich habe Sehnsucht nach Wien. Ich oh. möchte einen Film gern drüber machen. Wie soll der Film ausschauen? Alle schönen Sachen, die ich als Kind gesehen habe. Und was waren das? Die schon? Oper und die spanische Reitschule und das Schönbrunn. Meine Schule in Döbling, was immer. Ich weiß nicht. Sie hat oft Namen genannt. Nicht? Also auch große Wirtschaftsindustriekapitäne wie den Gianni Agnelli. Den hätte ich heiraten sollen, hat sie zu mir einmal gesagt. Nicht? Der also war offenbar an ihr interessiert. Aber das war ein ähnliches Interesse wie wahrscheinlich das Interesse des Fritz Mandl. Wie der Orson, Orson Welles war einmal bei mir im Haus, hat sie gesagt, da haben die Fußboden gezittert, der Fußboden gezittert, was immer sie damit gemeint hat. Nicht? Aber sie war so irgendwie, und der hat mich angerufen und der wollte mich sprechen und die haben mir, und soll ich das tun oder nicht. Das war also immer wieder, weil sie doch, also offenbar, ich habe einmal mit dem Norman Mähler über sie gesprochen, der sie gekannt hat und über den, dem, dem sie gegenüber, von dem sie kritisch gesprochen hat. Aber nicht, wegen, nicht von ihm als, als Mann und als, als männliche Erscheinung, sondern wegen seiner Haltung der, der Frauenbewegung gegenüber. Und das ist auch interessant. Sie war eindeutig eine Feministin. Nicht? Sie war also für Frauen, für die Gleichberechtigung der Frauen. Und sie wollte auch immer wieder sich selbstständig be, be, beweisen. Nicht? Sie war ja, wie Sie wissen, Filmproduzentin. Sie hat ganzes Geld praktisch in Filmproduktionen investiert, die dann nicht sehr erfolgreich waren. Warum haben Sie überhaupt Filme gemacht? Weil ich unabhängig sein wollte und will irgendwie. Ich finde, jeder Mensch in der Welt soll irgendwie unabhängig sein. Weil wir irgendwie immer allein sind. Hier und da sind wir zusammen, aber das ist sehr schön. Das soll man auch sein. Aber im Prinzip sind wir doch ganz allein. Hier sind Sie da, Barbara McLaughlin. Weil die, 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 da war eine andere Frau, die Licensing ist ja ein irrsinniges Geschäft. How about Licensing, Hedy Lamar? I recently discovered her in a small town near Orlando, Florida. She's Austrian, as you may know, speaks an impeccable Viennese, just won an international award for a guided missile system. She invented and wants to market her name. Yeah, that's what it is. Write a book and get a special Oscar next year. Chantal is here. This is how we always forget. A functionable, disposable... This is my sheet. Chantal has to always. A functionable disposable accordion type attachment for and on any size Kleenex box is the solution for used Kleenex in this use. <laughs> Heli Lama, 1910, March the 1st. Attachment, 
Sie sind otherwise, ja, Sie wissen, was Sie da meinen, steckst. Ja, so war es. Jetzt ständig, also das war alles, und das hat sie bitte ernst genommen. Dann hier. March 2nd. Also da, da, war, da war sie in einer schöpferischen Phase. Da ist eine Zeichnung von hier. Zeichnungen von hier. Eve of the Peacock. Der Abend des, 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 des äh, Faust. Faust. Ich glaube, ich, also bitte, und ich glaube, sie war geistesgar. Sie war schizophren. Was ja bei vielen Künstlern der Fall ist. Dann, einen Verlag für das Buch Biografie zu finden. Sind Sie dazu noch einen anderen Titel gehabt? No one leaves Delilah. No one leaves Delilah. Was natürlich auch sehr interessant ist. Das war ihre größte Rolle. Aber was das sie No one leaves Delilah. Well, I had Ida Marr live next door to me in the next condominium. And I knew her for about two, two and a half years. At the beginning, she was very, she is very quiet, never makes any noise, and she lived, she lived her own life. She's very private, very, very private. And uh, for, for her to, for you to get to talk to her, you had, she had to know you for a long time, because she didn't want to be bothered with people. You know, she was, she was an old lady, but she was a great old lady, and a beautiful woman, great movie star. And uh, when I was in the service, in my, on the ship I was on, I had her picture taped onto my locker. And here, 70 years later or something like that, I'm, I'm living next door to her. So that, to me, that was a big thrill. Yeah, my pinup, yeah. On the ship, I just to look at him and dream. There's a lot of stories about that, but what happened was there was a, 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 one of these transit, what they call them, a, a man that wants to be a woman? Uh, yeah, and they were shopping together, and they were probably arguing, and she told me that she got some cosmetics and stuck it in her purse without her knowing it. And then when she went out the door, that's when the bell went off. And actually, she's heading to Mars, she says, I didn't put it there, you know, they didn't believe her. Especially with her accent and all that. And that's how it all came about. If it had been me, they'd have said, give it back to me, don't come back here again, you know. But that they had to call the police, they had to make a big issue out of it. And she changed a little bit after this? She stayed more at home? She, uh, she after that, yes, she came more recluse. Over here, Lakeview, pool. She used to be out there swimming at night by herself. So you kind of observed her while she was swimming in the night? She was just swimming. I, uh, I never, that time of the night, I'm in bed. I talked to her on the phone when I was on the police department here in Omaha. And uh, I believe it was about 41 years before I actually went to see her. And uh, she was very gracious and uh, we sat and we talked. And uh, my son, uh, not at that time, but I believe he had talked to her earlier, got in contact with her. He's the one who found out where she was and her address and all these things. And uh, he's uh, the one that primarily got me. Uh, I had to take a vacation from my work and go down there and visit with her. She uh, aged, uh, not too kindly, but but she still acted, you know, and you know, like she was the queen. And uh, she remembered me, and we talked, and we played some games, and uh, it was uh, very cordial. But she did remind me that I made my choice. <laughs> so you were still a little bit angry on you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think so. Yes. I think that she did the best job she could as a mother with her schedule. And uh, I know she loved me. And uh, I don't think about it much. All I know is I have always called her mother. She's still my mother as far as I'm concerned, my stepmother or not. And uh, that's how I feel about it. It's uh, somebody else's problem about the Hollywood system. It was her problem, possibly my sister's and brother's problem. But I wasn't there, I'd, so I just made my own life. Eddie was an eccentric. I'd come home here some days and say, why do I work for that crazy woman? You know, and then, because she'd really get to you. She'd, you know, this is this, this is that, this is... Um, one day she accused me of taking two dollars off of her table. Money. It was supposed to be on the table. She accused me of stealing her two dollars. Well, she paid me too good to take two dollars. The next week when I went back, I reorganized the table and laid it right there on the table. There's your two dollars. And she, then she apologized. She was in it. She never came out of it. She was a very, very much a recluse. She wouldn't let anybody see her, which, you know, on some days she'd be all uh, giddy and happy and dress up and put on a little makeup and put on scarves and have her hair fixed. And then other days she'd go in and Hetty would be in the dark. I mean, I remember the day we moved her, physically moved her. She hid in the car. She wore her dark glasses, a hat over, and scrunched down in the seat, you know, of the car because we were moving her to the new house. She didn't want anybody to see her. She and when her. we got her there, we pulled her into the garage and let her out in the garage because she didn't want anybody to know, you know, that she was there. Well, I can remember buying that bottle of Dom Perignon. It was the Millennium. Hetty wanted to see the Millennium. She made it because she died in 2000. But she wanted to see the Millennium, and she needed a bottle of Dom Perignon to celebrate it. But she never opened the bottle. The bottle was there when she died. Her I've never been loved like that. See, had in the last Jahrzehnten of her life actually nur in the Tag hinein. Also, was sie bitte, sie hat genug gehabt, um sich zu erinnern. Sie hat aus ihrem Leben etwas gemacht, keine Frage. Aber ein Leben, ein Leben wie in ihrem Fall, kann sehr lange dauern. Nicht? Sie hat sehr einfach gelebt. Sie haben ja wahrscheinlich das Haus gesehen in Orlando. Und, ähm, sie, war, sie war zurückgezogen, bescheiden. Nicht? Obwohl sie sich bewusst war, was für eine, dass sie eine historische Erscheinung ähm, ist. Aber sie war... Sie hat sich nicht, eigentlich, das kann man wohl sagen, sie hat sich nicht gestellt. Sie ist nie zum Stillstand gekommen. Sie, she never faced herself. Sie war ständig auf der Flucht. Seit sie aus Österreich geflüchtet ist, war sie immer auf der Flucht, bis, in, bis zum letzten Tag. Mein Leben war sehr farbenvoll. Das ist voller Leben und Oben und unten und drüber und drunter. Aber <lacht> ich bedauere gar nichts, weil ich habe sehr viel gelernt. Und ich weiß, dass dieses Staat Amerika viel zu lernen hat. Weil, sagen wir doch, eigentlich hier ist nie eine Bombe gefallen. Und überall anders, ja. Nicht? Darum wissen wir gar nicht, wie das ist, dass man einfach... Hunger hat oder irgend sowas. Das gibt's ja nicht. Die schmeißen ja alles weg. 
Sie haben die Brücken abgebrochen und dann sehnsuchtsvoll ans andere Ufer geschaut, mhm. war aber nicht bereit, ins Wasser zu springen. Und das war nicht ihre Art. Nicht? Mhm. Und da ergibt sich eben die große Frage ihrer, ihrer, ihres Charakters. Ich glaube, dass sie in Wahrheit eine sehr melancholische, romantische und in vieler Hinsicht unschuldige Frau war. Die eigentlich für diese Welt, ich meine, das ist grotesk, wenn man das über die schönste Frau ihrer Zeit sagt oder des Jahrhunderts, dass sie eigentlich sich in dieser Welt nicht zurechtgefunden hat, die nämlich, kein, nämlich eine Scheinwelt war. Und die einzig wirkliche Welt, in der sie gelebt hat, war erstens als Kind in, in, im Elternhaus und dann wahrscheinlich im Alter ähm, in Orlando, Florida, wo, wo, wo sie mit ihrem Nachbarn, einem Polizisten und dessen Frau ein sehr inniges, fast möchte ich sagen, Familienleben geführt hat. Ich habe immer ein Gefühl über die Jahre und ich wusste, dass die schlecht waren und noch geblieben sind, folge ich ja. Jetzt habe ich ein sehr gutes Gefühl von allen Seiten. Ich weiß, dass ich irgendwie Hoffnung, sehr große Hoffnung habe und das ist wichtig. Ohne Hoffnung kann man überhaupt nicht leben. Two years ago, after 35 years of residing in the wax museum, the wax figure of Hedy Lamarr was put in storage because the uh, new director of the museum wants all new figures. And the juicy part of the story is that we had a man working as a floor manager who was picking up girls on Hollywood Boulevard, and then after closing time, he was taking them into the museum and having sex with them. So the storage area where the wax figure of Hedy Lamarr and Shirley Tempo and two other wax figures that Mr. Horn couldn't remember what, who they were, they were being stored by a piano underneath a stairway in the museum. And this man took his victim in there and had sex on the piano and knocked over all four wax figures and the wax figure Hedy Lamar fell over, both arms were broken off it, and the head was damaged beyond repair. And uh, that's the story of what happened to the wax figure of Hedy Lamar. <laughs>